committee will come to order. We, uh, the subcommittees will come to order. We uh, welcome our guests today. We'll introduce you here in a few minutes. You know how this works. We typically, you know, you've got to listen to politicians talk first. You know, it's a crazy way we do things here. But we'll have some opening statements from um, the chairman of the respective subcommittees and the ranking members. Then we'll get right to your testimony. We'll swear you in and, and, um, and then, of course, get to the questions on this important, important uh, subject matter that's been in the news of late. And, um, this is an ongoing series of hearings we are doing on First Amendment um, liberties and protecting those First Amendments, whether it's on college campuses, whether it's in, in, from the pulpit in some of our churches, or whether it's uh, now today about the uh, freedom of the press. So uh, again, we thank you for being here, and we'll start with our opening statements. When the, Jefferson once said, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When governments fear the people, there is liberty. And I would like to kind of offer that as a context for evaluating um, this issue today as we move through it, uh, this, uh, this important thing. Critical freedom of the press is pursuit of truth without government entanglements or intimidation, yet we have seen previous administrations wiretapping journalists' phones and issuing subpoenas for the identity of their sources. For this reason, we signed on to my good friend Professor Raskin's Free Flow of Information Act, which limits the government in compelling a journalist to reveal his or her sources. Professor Raskin and I may not agree often. Uh, but we uh, are both committed to reaffirming our First Amendment freedoms, especially the guarantee government cannot intimidate or censor the town crier, be it the chief contributor to the New York Times or a freelancer in the Fourth District of Ohio. But it should come as no surprise that I advocate for government having the least consequential impact on Americans' lives, especially at the federal level where politicized prosecutors are unaccountable to the electorate. The creation of a federal shield law like H.R. 4382 is a reassurance for journalists and Americans alike that their government cannot stifle the flow of information. This legislation acts as a powerful antidote to government encroachment by placing a more stringent check on their investigative powers and those that improperly release classified information that jeopardizes national security and public safety should, of course, be prosecuted. But we cannot look the other way while our government intimidates journalists and tries to get their confidential sources. We need to keep a focus on that issue. Yesterday, committee staff were briefed by the Justice Department related to their internal policies for obtaining information from reporters. This was in response to a briefing request from Chairman Gowdy and fellow co-sponsor of the Free Flow of Information Act, uh, Congressman Meadows. I, along with members of the committee on both sides of the aisle, aim to continue to pressure our Justice Department to live up to the ideals set forth in the First Amendment. And I want to thank Professor Raskin again for his leadership on such an important legislative effort. And I'm glad to be working together in a bipartisan manner on this piece of legislation. I'll just further add, um, you think about what we've witnessed in the last few years where you had the agency with the power and influence that it has over Americans' lives, the Internal Revenue Service, systematically and for a sustained period of time, target people for their political beliefs. And then you see what's taken place recently, what we've recently learned at the Department of Justice and the FBI relative to the previous campaign and what was taken to the FISA court. Um, this is serious. And then when you add to it what we saw just a couple months ago with the reporter for the New York Times who had everything grabbed by the government, this is a serious issue. That's why we have the discussion in the hearing today, and that's why we have our witnesses, and it's why I'm pleased to be working with my colleagues in a bipartisan fashion. And with that, I would yield to the gentleman from Maryland for his comments. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your leadership uh, on this crucial legislation and for calling this hearing today. Um, my dad wrote shortly before his death in 2017 these words, democracy and its operating principle, the rule of law, require a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. The founders of American democracy were obsessed with giving the American people the means to acquire the truth. Madison said, a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge brings. Jefferson identified the central role of the press in preserving democracy. He said the only security of all is in a free press. So the First Amendment established a preferred place for freedom of the press, just as it established a preferred place for freedom of speech and freedom of religion. The Supreme Court has held that government can reasonably accommodate religious free exercise and worship, which is why federal law can exempt Native American Indians using peyote for sacramental purposes where, when it bans it generally. It is why public schools can create exemptions for students and employees who observe religious holidays on official school days while not releasing other students 
and employees. These laws are not constitutionally necessary, but the courts have found them to be constitutionally permissible as, an, as a reasonable accommodation of religious liberty, which occupies a high place in our pantheon of constitutional values. Well, the right of free press occupies a similarly exalted perch in our constitutional hierarchy. In theory, the specific command in the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of press was unnecessary because press freedom was already covered under freedom of speech. But the framers insisted upon protecting the distinctive and indispensable role that the press plays as a free institution in our democratic society. Not everyone can go to congressional hearings. Not everyone can go to state legislative sessions or city or county council meetings late into the night. Not everyone can travel into war zones in Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam to determine the reality and the meaning of our foreign policies. Not everyone can personally uncover torture at Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo Bay or obtain the Pentagon Papers or break the Watergate scandal or determine how much oil leaked from the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico or figure out what the President and President Putin talked about in their secret meeting in Helsinki. But as citizens, we are all equally implicated by these events, and we are all equally invested in ascertaining the truth of what is happening in our name as citizens. This is why we need professional journalists and newspapers to get the information for us. The First Amendment protects a free press, but that abstract guarantee means nothing if reporters cannot protect confidential sources and whistleblowers, or if they have to li live in fear of criminal prosecution and jail time. When reporters cannot do their jobs, our ability to function as a reflective democracy suffers. The free press is not the enemy of the people. It is the people's best friend, and it is the enemy of tyrants everywhere. Jefferson said, we're left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government. He said, I would not hesitate a moment to choose the latter. As in other times of sharp political division, like the period of the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798, the press in America is under ferocious attack today. Reporters are berated and castigated daily. Journalists have been arrested, punched, attacked, and even murdered, including in my home state of Maryland, simply for doing their jobs. We cannot afford as a society to have reporters attacked or intimidated or fearful. They, we cannot have them afraid that they will be thrown into jail, jail just for doing their jobs. Congress must defend actively the free press and the American public's right to know what exactly the government is doing in our name. It's time to pass a federal shield law to protect the press whose work is essential to democracy. America favors shield laws to protect the media watchdogs. Fully 49 states in the District of Columbia have passed shield laws or adopted some sort of reporter's privilege. What more evidence do we need that the American people want to see a free and aggressive press to expose corruption and safeguard the workings of democracy. Mr. Chairman, you and I introduced the Free Flow of Information Act of 2017 last November after Attorney General Sessions, in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee, refused to commit not to jail journalists for doing their jobs. Uh, I approached you on the spot and asked you whether you would introduce this measure with me, and I will never forget your immediate and enthusiastic response. It has given me hope that we can indeed come together as citizens and lovers of the Constitution across party lines to defend the basic institutions of our democracy. Throughout our history, dozens of journalists have served or been threatened with jail time for protecting their sources. One of these journal journalists I know quite well, Brian Karam, who is one of my constituents and the current Montgomery County Sentinel executive editor. In 1990 and 1991, Brian went to jail four different times to protect confidential sources while working as a TV reporter. The last time he went to jail for nearly two weeks while the Supreme Court considered his case and was only spared a long sentence when his confidential source, once she had moved from Texas to California and no longer feared for her life, came forward and revealed her own identity. <clears throat> confidential sources like this are essential not only in investigative journalism, whether these short sources shed light on government abuse and corruption, as was the case with Watergate, the Pentagon Papers, or the abuse of detainees at Abu Ghraib in Iraq, but also in routine news gathering and the daily reporting of local news stories that, stories that immediately and directly influence the lives of our people. The Free Flow of Information Act is long overdue, but there could be no better time to pass it than now, a time of peril to the republic, a time of corruption when foreign governments are trying to subvert our elections and when the basic values of society are in danger. 
Mr. Chairman, this exact same Federal Shield legislation passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support in 2007, and the bill was championed by none other than then-Congressman, then now Vice President Mike Pence. It provides covered reporters with a qualified privilege and contains exceptions for compelled disclosure of a source whenever national security is threatened or when there is a threat of imminent bodily harm or death and in other discrete and limited situations. It would not cover reporters who are suspected of committing a crime themselves, nor would it give reporters the right to interfere with law enforcement working to solve a crime. This is an area, I think, where we can all come together across party lines to defend the basic pillars of American democracy. I agree very strongly with Vice President Pence, who said it's not a Democratic or Republican issue. It's an issue for all Americans, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I thank you again for your leadership. You bet. It looks like we got some students who are leaving. We want to thank you all for being here. Um, thank you so much. It takes a professor to drive them out of the room. So. <laughs> it wasn't the professor. It was the nine pages in your speech. No, <laughs> no it was all good. Uh, it was all good. The, uh, the, the, the gentleman from Alabama, the subcommittee chair, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, an informed citizenry is a hallmark of American representative democracy, and without the free flow of information, we fail to hold those in power accountable. At the core of American exceptionalism is the liberty granted to its people to scrutinize its own government as first witnessed by Thomas Paine and common sense. I want to thank Chairman Jordan for joining with the Intergovernmental Affairs Subcommittee and holding this hearing today. Our subcommittees have held a series of First Amendment hearings examining how certain rights, like the right to speak freely at college campuses, must be protected and reaffirmed. The American press has the freedom to report on matters of importance to the public without fear of recourse from the government. Yet over several administrations, the Justice Department has welded tactics like threatening subpoenas and even imprisonment in an attempt to compel journalists to reveal their confidential sources. While these tactics uh, may be used in good faith investigation of criminal matters, it does demonstrate why a federal shield law is critical. The Supreme Court addressed the freedom of the press in its seminal 1972 case, Brandsburg v. Hayes. In this case, Justice White said Congress has freedom to determine whether a statutory newsman's privilege is necessary and desirable and to fashion standards and rules as narrow or broad as deemed necessary. Meanwhile, in the absence of a federal shield law, states have rolled out their own. As chairman of the Intergovernmental Affairs Subcommittee, I see the necessity of states to tailor laws and practices to, to fit the unique needs of their citizen, citizenry. But the emerging patchwork of state laws and federal circuit courts have left journalists unsure of their protections from the federal government and sends a chilling effect throughout the press. A federal shield law like H.R. 4382 will further empower journalists to pursue the truth and hold the government accountable. As uh, Ranking Member Raskins pointed out, this is not the first time that a law like this has been introduced. It was introduced by then Representative Mike Pence, but also by Ted Poe, and now uh, jointly by Chairman Jordan and, and Ranking Member Raskins. I want to thank my friend Chairman Jordan and my friend Ranking Member Professor Raskins for their leadership in this effort. And I yield back. I think the gentleman, the right fine gentleman from Illinois is recognized. I got to spend some time with you in Ohio over the 4th of July and did a great job at that, uh, that event with uh, doctors from with an Indian American heritage. So Mr. Christian Morthy is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Palmer. Thank you, Ranking Member Raskin, for your leadership on this issue. And thank you to our witnesses for coming in today. Um, a free and flourishing press is a cornerstone of our democracy. Our founding fathers understood the importance of an independent press, and that's why uh, they embedded this particular uh, right within the First Amendment to the Constitution. A free press informs the public and holds leaders to account. I know because I get a lot of letters based on what was written in the newspaper about me, and uh, so I know firsthand that uh, the free press holds us to account. In order for the press to truly be free, however, reporters must be able to protect their sources, whether they are government whistleblowers or corporate insiders. This crucial ability to protect confidential sources has been eroding over the past several years. As our government has sought to crack down on leaks, more and more reporters have been pressured to reveal their sources. The current administration is no exception to that trend. In fact, last August, Attorney General Sessions announced that the Department of Justice had tripled 
had tripled the number of active leak investigations, saying, and I quote, this culture of leaking must stop. There is no question that classified or other legally protected information must be properly handled. But our government should not prosecute the journalists who expose corporate and government wrongdoing with the information that whistleblowers bring them. Although almost all states have shield laws, they vary in scope and do not apply in federal cases where courts have issued conflicting rulings. That is why a federal shield bill is so important. Vice President Pence, as mentioned before, sponsored such a bill in 2007, which passed the House with broad bipartisan support. I'm glad that Representative Ra Representatives Raskin and Jordan have introduced a shield bill this Congress, and I hope it will be given full consideration. But we have a lot of work to do. In the World Press Freedom Index, the United States ranking fell to 45th in the world. According to Reporters Without Borders, which compiles this particular index, our President Trump has fostered further decline in journalists' right to report. He has called the press, quote unquote, the enemy of the American people, and labeled unfavorable coverage, quote unquote, fake news. He has also called for revoking broadcasting licenses of certain mainstream news outlets. President Trump has expressed hostility to a freed press, but undermining legitimate journalism is dangerous. It makes us less informed and erodes our trust in government. It wears away the fabric of our society. That is why I'm glad we are holding this hearing. We must work together on a bipartisan basis to strengthen our commitment to a robust free press. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Now please introduce our witnesses. We have first Mr. Lee Levine, Senior Counsel at Ballard, Ballard Spar, excuse me, and Ms., uh, second we have Ms. Cheryl Atkinson, investigative correspondent and host of Full Measure, someone whose story I'm familiar with, uh, what, what Ms. Atkinson went through, and I'm sure you're going to tell us about that. It was just simply unbelievable. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, Mr. Rick Bloom, Policy Director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Welcome to all of you. What we normally do in this committee is we swear you in, so if you'll please stand up, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record show each witness answered in the affirmative, and we're going to move, um, we'll move right down the aisle. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Levine, you go first, and then Cheryl, and then Mr. Bloom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittees. I last appeared before a committee of this House 11 years ago. The topic was the Free Flow of Information Act of 2007, which has been mentioned was co-sponsored by now Vice President Mike Pence. It passed this chamber with overwhelming bipartisan support, but never received a vote in the Senate. My message to you today is a simple one. The time has come to enact just such legislation codifying a reporter's privilege in the federal courts. You should do so based on the unassailable historical fact that confidential sources are often essential to the press's ability to inform the American people about matters of vital public concern. While there is, as there should be, healthy ongoing debate within the journalism profession about the appropriate use of confidential sources, all sides of that debate agree that they are at times essential to effective news reporting. As then-Congressman Pence testified before the House Judiciary Committee in 2007, and I quote, compelling reporters to testify, and in particular, compelling them to reveal the identity of their confidential sources is a detriment to the public interest. Indeed, for almost three decades following the Supreme Court's 1972 decision in Brandsburg versus Hayes, subpoenas issued by federal courts seeking disclosure of journalists' confidential sources were rare. Since that time, however, the situation has changed dramatically. In the last 15 years, a period that spans three separate presidential administrations, a substantial number of subpoenas seeking the identities of confidential sources have been issued by federal courts to a variety of media organizations, the journalists they employ, and the third parties that provide them with telephone and email services. In my 2007 testimony, I described in some detail the significant increase in the number of such subpoenas in the immediately preceding years. Unfortunately, since that testimony, the drumbeat has continued unabated. In 2008, for example, 
the Department of Justice issued the first of what became multiple grand jury and trial subpoenas to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist James Risen, seeking to compel his testimony in the criminal prosecution of former CIA employee Jeffrey Sterling. Two separate presidential administrations pursued Mr. Risen's testimony over a period of five years. Ultimately, the United States Court of Appeals held that there is no reporter's privilege in criminal cases in the federal courts of the Fourth Circuit and that Mr. Risen was therefore obliged to testify. Significantly, following the Fourth Circuit's ruling and Mr. Risen's ongoing refusal to betray his promises to his sources, the Justice Department decided not to call him to testify at Mr. Sterling's trial. Nevertheless, even without Mr. Risen's testimony, Mr. Sterling was convicted which makes you question how necessary Mr. Risen's testimony was in the first place. In 2013, the Justice Department seized two months' worth of phone records connected to more than 20 telephone lines of the Associated Press's offices and journalists, including their home phones and their cell phones. It did so not by seeking such information directly from the AP or the journalists involved, but rather by issuing, without their knowledge, subpoenas to their telephone service providers. That same year, in the course of a criminal investigation of alleged leaks involving North Korea, the Department secured warrants authorizing, pro authorizing prosecutors to monitor the phone calls and emails of Fox News correspondent James Rosen, again without his knowledge. The public outcry that resulted from the AP subpoena and the Rosen search warrant prompted the Department to revise substantially its internal guidelines governing the use of such compulsory process. Nevertheless, the practice has apparently continued, despite the change in administrations in the interim. Earlier this year, the Justice Department revealed that it had secretly procured years' worth of phone and email records of a New York Times reporter. It remains unclear whether the Department complied with its own guidelines when it did so, although that is largely an academic question, since most courts have held that the guidelines are not judicially enforceable in any event. Things were not always this way. In the almost three decades immediately following the Supreme Court's decision in Brandsburg, both the federal courts and DOJ largely construed that precedent to provide to journalists a privilege grounded either in the First Amendment or in federal common law that protected them in most federal court proceedings, civil and criminal. In recent years, however, that judicial consensus has broken down. As I have noted, Mr. Risen was authoritatively informed by the Fourth Circuit that he had no lawful ability to protect the identities of his confidential sources in response to a subpoena issued by a Federal Court sitting in Virginia. But if that same subpoena had been issued by a Federal Court in Delaware, less than 120 miles to the north, he would have enjoyed a privilege grounded in Federal common law as construed by the Third Circuit. And if the subpoena had been issued by a Federal Court in Georgia, some 300 miles to the south, he would have been protected by a First Amendment-based privilege recognized in the Eleventh Circuit. Make no mistake, the drumbeat of subpoenas, coupled with the lack of clear guidance concerning the recognition and scope of a reporter's privilege in the Federal courts, has impaired the ability of the American people to receive information about the operations of their government and the state of the world in which we live. I respectfully submit that the time has long since come for congressional action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levine. That was, uh, that was good. good. Good history. We appreciate that. Um, Ms. Atkinson, you are recognized for your five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I remember a few years ago reporting on a story at CBS News, and I always asked our lawyers there to vet my stories for fairness and legality. And on this particular day, I was going over some documents with them provided by an inside source who had exposed some corporate wrongdoing. I had vetted the documents and gotten other sources to appear on camera for a story. The attorneys wanted to know, if we're challenged in court on this story, can we disclose the insider's name? I said, no, he would lose his job. It would ruin him. Why? They explained that the law had been changing and it was not to the benefit of journalists or our sources. They told me that we could no longer guarantee protection of the identity of our sensitive sources if challenged in court by, say, the company we were doing the story about. You'd have to give up the name, my lawyers told me. Or else what, I said. You'd probably go to prison. That made getting truthful information that's in the public's interest that much harder. I could no longer promise people who are willing to expose corporate or government wrongdoing that I could protect their identities at all costs. Obviously, I'm just one reporter, but you can multiply my experience by so many others. Here are just a couple of examples of stories I covered over the years that might not get told today because sources feel threatened. 
My investigation into fraud inside the Red Cross after all the 9-11 donations, which was recognized with an investigative Emmy Award, was possible only with assistance from inside sources who provided me with audits and information. Stories exposing wrongdoing with Ford and Firestone and covering up long-known deadly tire dangers, another Emmy-nominated investigation, might have gone untold. Same with my investigations into Enron, Halliburton, prescription drugs, and countless others. Stories that arguably led to life saves and taxpayer money saved. It was with help from inside intelligence sources that I broke the story at CBS of the Chinese stealing our most sensitive nuclear secrets. I was also able to break the news that the FBI lied about evidence in that case against their suspect, Wen Ho Lee. They claimed he had failed a lie detector test when I was able to get the polygraph and show that he had actually passed with flying colors. Without the ability to protect confidential sources, I probably wouldn't have been able to report that the CDC was alarming our nation with a swine flu epidemic, but the vast majority of cases blamed on swine flu were not swine flu or any sort of flu at all. And I wouldn't have been able to break the stories about how BP and the government provided false information about how much oil was really leaking into the ocean after the BP oil spill. In the past decade, we've seen the government attack sources with a zeal that should be applied to those committing the wrongdoing exposed. Instead, the wrongdoers are often protected. In some cases, they're the ones prosecuting the whistleblowers. The greatest offense a government insider can commit today is not, for example, improperly unmasking names of US citizens for political purposes. It's providing information of wrongdoing to a journalist. Someone could go to jail over the so-called leak, but not the actual wrongdoing exposed. And sadly, we now have ample evidence that bad actors in government will go to shocking extremes, violating constitutional rights and possibly laws to hunt down our sources. In my case, I'm still litigating against the FBI and others connected to the intel community for their intrusions into my computers when I was at CBS News. The honest intel-connected sources who helped me discover this include a former FBI unit chief. The actions of the computer intruders, which we can trace forensically, imply that they were desperate to learn who my sources are and what I might be about to report. Talk about chilling. After that information became public, everyone from intelligence community sources to corporate whistleblowers have told me that they hesitate to communicate with me because they believe I'm being monitored. And nothing has happened to the computer intruders to this day. Instead, the Justice Department simply uses unlimited taxpayer money to fight my case in court. In the big picture, I can't help but see this as part of a growing and organized effort to control a free press. I'm concerned about new movements to force schools to teach media literacy and to invite third parties to curate our information and determine what's fake news and what's true. My research shows that these efforts are often the opposite of what they seem. The forces behind them may be trying to actually shape public opinion by preventing us from seeing certain facts and views. If these trends were in effect in the past, we might not know that cigarettes are bad for you. The whistleblower wouldn't talk. The studies would be buried by algorithms at Google and Facebook because curators and media literacy experts would declare the research to be conspiratorial. They'd point to settled science that proves cigarettes are perfectly safe, maybe even good for you. News outlets and reporters daring to pierce the narrative would be controversialized, bullied on social media, and forced out of their jobs. Make no mistake, the ongoing government and corporate crackdown on whistleblowers and journalists who report their stories is a war. Our truthful information threatens the persistent bureaucracy and powers that be like nothing else, and they are increasingly desperate to control information and narratives. We can only guess what important stories in the public interest will never be told because of a less free press. Thank you. Very good as well. Mr. Bloom. Chairman, Jer Chairman Jordan, Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Krista Murthy, and Ranking Member Raskin, thank you for holding the hearing and for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you as well to you for uh, your leadership on the issue, especially as a constituent of Mr. Raskin. I appreciate you working on this. Today I'm testifying in my capacity as Policy Director for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which has existed for almost five decades and subpoenas uh, is something that we've been working on for a very long time and on behalf of News Media for Open Government, a coalition of news media associations. I want to highlight three points. First, confidential sources are vital to keeping citizens informed about our communities as well as about national stories that impact us and our lives. And I'll mention a few examples. 
Second, conflicts continue, as Mr. Levine mentioned, over subpoenas and other demands for information during the, obtained during the news gathering process, including the identities of, of sources. And third, the Free Flow of Information Act is a common sense approach that sets out clear legal standards recognizing that the need to protect sources can coexist with the government's responsibility to protect human life and enforce the law. And as you have heard, confidential sources are essential to an informed public and accountable government. Journalists prefer to attach identities to their sources in a story. There are times, however, when to bring a story to the public, sources must be protected, even though in many cases the source's identity is known to the reporter. When checked with multiple sources, authenticated and vetted for accuracy, information from unnamed sources has been critical for journalists to keep the public informed about problems facing veterans uh, who are trying to obtain medical care, police misconduct investigations into suspected fraud and the policy choices facing presidents in the face of global challenges. Coverage of the current administration is no different in that respect. Many subpoenas and other demands for journalists' notes and sources relate to news gathering on topics that have nothing to do with national security. An unnamed source was critical to getting to the truth about the 2014 shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago. One reporter, Jamie Calvin, used a confidential source, a witness, to corroborate that the official police accounting of the shooting did not match what the autopsy showed. His reporting led to an investigation into the police officer's conduct, the release of a video of the shooting, a murder charge against one of the police officers, and an effort to compel Mr. Calvin's testimony to identify his source. Calvin benefited from legal and institutional support, including from my attorney colleagues at the Reporters Committee, which enabled him to successfully fight to quash the subpoena. He was fortunate. In another now infamous example, the startup company Theranos gained widespread attention for its claims of a breakthrough in testing blood using only a few drops of blood at a fraction of the cost of traditional methods. When reporters dug into the story, they discovered sources who knew the company could not back up its claims with scientific evidence. That reporting unraveled the story and led to fraud charges against the company's founder. No topic of news coverage is immune to demands for journalists' sources and material. From eyewitness observation of an execution in Alabama to interviews with individuals who occupied a federal wildlife refuge in Oregon a few years ago, and I'll add an investigation into steroid use in baseball. A Federal Shield law would protect a wide range of news coverage. The Free Flow of Information Act provides a qualified, as you have heard, but not absolute privilege that sets strong standards for courts to follow when deciding whether to compel a journalist to reveal a source. And media, sorry, I want to make one other point. Media lawyers I have spoken with tell me that in the 49 states that recognize a journalist source privilege, something interesting happens. Even the existence of the shield law goes a long way to avoid unnecessary litigation. So to conclude, Chairman Jordan and Chairman Palmer enacting the Free Flow of Information Act would strengthen the independence of the press and the sources upon which the public relies to be fully informed on a daily basis. Thank you for the chance to testify, and I look forward to your questions. You bet. Uh, the gentleman from Alabama is recognized for five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Levine, what does it mean for journalists to have qualified privileges? Well, there are two important words there. One is qualified and one is privilege. The privilege means that, at least presumptively, they will not have to disclose the identity of their confidential sources or unpublished information that they chose for journalistic reasons not to publish in response to compulsory process like a subpoena. The qualified part means that that is not absolute, so that this bill and, I think, most reasonable people recognize that there have to be narrowly drawn exceptions to that, um, like are set forth in this bill with respect to terrorism or imminent threats to national security. Um, and I, I think one of the geniuses of this bill is that it really does articulate very well those limited exceptions and articulates how limited they are and need to be. Well, I thank you for that answer because it. it uh, led into what I was going to come to next, because a lot of people are going to be concerned about whether or not we um, go to such great lengths to protect the confidentiality between a, re a journalist and, and their source, even to the to the extent that that we might not get information to defend us against an attack, or that might compromise uh, national security. But 
even uh, uh, with the law that, that, that we have here or, or the bill that we have here, um, that's not an issue. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that. And in fact, the, the, the exceptions to the application of the privilege, that is the issue, the instances in which the qualified privilege would yield are taken almost verbatim from the Department of Justice's own guidelines that the Department has itself purported to govern itself by over the last 40, 50 years. The only difference here is that the decisions that the Department's made will now be reviewable by a court instead of being undertaken in their unbridled discretion. Ms. Atkinson, uh, you have broken, you've been involved in some major stories, <coughs> Fast and Furious and Benghazi, and Obviously, your ability to report on those, conduct your own investigations, has been uh, uh, greatly enhanced by being able to protect, uh, protect confidential sources. But in your testimony, you said that uh, um, your activities were being monitored. Am I correct? Is that how you said that? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, you know, uh, how you were being monitored? Do you believe you were being wiretapped or that? There are other intrusive methods that were being utilized. According to our forensics reports, would, would you hit the, the mic, please? According to our forensics reports, and we have four separate independent reports that give similar pieces of the puzzle. Um, there was a long-term effort to monitor my computers and, <clears throat> excuse me, phone devices, both my personal computers and my CBS computers. But how would they monitor that without <clears throat> a warrant? Well. We don't know that they didn't have a warrant, although I had two sources tell me there was no FISA warrant. So the way I'm told that sometimes works is they identify someone in the orbit of the person they want to watch, and then they capture, capture you in incidental surveillance, meaning they pretend that it was sort of an accident, and then they kind of reverse engineer it so that they can actually get the information from the person who was really the target that they didn't think they could get a warrant from. So as we've conducted our uh, investigations forensically, there have been a lot of questions about who I might have contacted in foreign countries, which would create a pretext or a premise to make it look as though someone needed to be watched on that end, which would then sweep up my communications as well. All right. I, I just wondered if you'd filed a, a Freedom of Information Act request uh, on that to, to try to determine the extent of, of yes, sir. intrusive. Yes, sir. The FBI has um, repeatedly denied my Freedom of Information Act requests or not fulfilled them properly, claiming they don't have information that they provably do have. And there's, as you may know from your previous FOIA work, very little that can be done about that. Well, Mr. Bloom, I don't want you to feel left out. Uh, questions from a gentleman from Alabama. So I want, uh, one of the things that I'm looking at are all these states that have basically a patchwork of, of laws that cover this. and. One of the things that I, I was wondering about is you could be in one state and be covered and be in another state and not be covered. You might be an out-of-state journalist and not be covered by any state law. Can you elaborate on that, please? Well, I, I think, as Mr. Levine mentioned, that it, depending on which court you're, you're fighting the subpoena, you, know, you may get a different result. We all start with the First Amendment, but at, the, at you know, the current state of affairs, you may be in Alabama and you may be able to successfully fight a, you know, a request for a, a murder suspect to want to interview you about the kind of interviews you've done. Um, the problem with that is you're also going to be cross-examined. Uh, so a reporter doesn't want to be put in the position of, of providing all their notes. Um, but it is true that there are, uh, it is very much a patchwork. I generally am not for extending federal power, but I think when it comes to constitutional issues, and, and I, uh, I really think this is an area where the federal government does have a legitimate need to intervene, and again, I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Raskin and, and Chairman Jordan for their work on this. I think this is important work. And um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to Chairman Palmer for his excellent questions there. Um, so the, I just want to ask some questions to help illuminate exactly what our bill is going to do. Mr. Levine, let me start with you. Um, if if we adopt um, a press shield bill like this and a reporter um, were walking down the street and saw a crime, um, would they owe the sovereign their testimony or would they be able to get out of it because of the reporter shield bill? There is a provision in the bill that deals with eyewitness observations of criminal conduct 
differently than the normal source reporter relationship. Okay. Um, there are still some hoops to jump through, but as a, as a rule, uh, a request for testimony of eyewitness observation of a crime other than a crime that would be committed by giving information to a journalist. Exactly. Um, but but the, the point is that as long as they're not operating in their professional capacity as a journalist, they would be able to testify about criminal activity they witnessed like everybody else and would be required to. Th that's true, too, because the definition of a covered person only applies to people who are engaged in the process of doing their jobs. As okay, well. Ms. Atkins, let me come to you. A lot of people seem to think that um, investigative journalism only rarely depends on anonymous sources, and it's only investigative journalism. It's not other types. And I wonder if you could uh, shed some light on this for us. How important are um, confidential sources to the work of journalists? Yes, sir. In my case, and I've done both kinds of reporting extensively, even when we are not using in a finished story anonymous sources or confidential sources, they're often the genesis of a story. We, we may find other people on the record to confirm and be the, the voices in the face of a story after somebody who was confidential flagged us to the story or may, maybe flagged us to some original information. So in my experience in both kinds of reportings, it's absolutely critical to be able to speak to people and have them believe that they're not going to be, their identity is not going to be revealed. Great. <clears throat> Mr. Billman, come to you. Um, is there anything illegitimate about people speaking on an off the record or deep background basis to reporters? I, I confess I think I've done that myself, certainly as a state senator. I don't know if I've ever done it in Congress. But um, is anonymous speech protected under our Constitution? Anonymous speech is protected, and oftentimes there's a great utility in having a conversation with a, a, a source about, um, because they can give you some background. They can give you, here's what's really happening. You know, we, you may not, I, I don't want my name attached to it because if I, gets out, then, you know, I'm going to get in trouble with my supervisor. But you learn a lot of detail that, that you wouldn't otherwise know about what's really happening. It's also very useful for journalists. If they have a story, they're going to go to, their, to the, an agency, um, this happened with national security stories, to say, here's the story, here's what we have, you know, let us know. We'd like to see if you have any national security concerns about reporting. And they might change a word, they might delay the story for a day, but there are, there are those conversations and it's important that they be done. Great. Um, all of us grow up with um, the wisdom of the founding fathers about the importance of the press as a watchdog and the importance of the sunlight that the media brings as a disinfectant to potential corruption in government. Um, but beyond um, th those things that we learn in school, I wonder if any of you or all of you would sh care to share um, a contemporary example of a place where you think the press has played a really important role and confidential sources have been critical to the ability of the press to inform the public of something that it needs to know about. I gave quite a few examples, including the BP oil spill. I don't know if that's contemporary anymore. Yeah. But um, well, what that's... exactly happened in that one? Well, when I was asked to cover that story for CBS News, it was several weeks into the story, and there had not been a lot of news unearthed, so they felt that I needed to dig into that. And one of the first things I asked was, where was the video? Because I realized intuitively there was probably a video, an undersea camera. And with the help, actually, of um, Senator Markey, and actually then Representative Markey, and Senator Nelson, and another senator whose name I can't remember, we worked together with FOIA and pressure to get the government who had these tapes but didn't want to release them to release them. But it was only with the help from some inside sources connected to the government that as I was able to, with some precision, report that the flow as reported by the government and its experts and by BP was false by a factor that was incredibly wildly wrong. They underestimated or understated? By far. By far. And I couldn't have had the confidence to report that. I did have on-camera sources uh, that do that sort of thing that did confirm it, but I couldn't have reported that story. And that was, that was a major story. Ultimately, I believe that was part of the criminal fraud conviction against BP was uh, them misleading the public on the size of the spill and the, and the flow. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from North Carolina, uh, Mr. Meadows, is recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank both of you to work for working in a bipartisan way on this particular piece of legislation. And, and my recommendation is, is that we get together in a bipartisan way and uh, use a little leverage to make sure that it gets a vote on the floor of the House. And so I'm sure there are a few critical pieces of legislation. And if uh, you, Mr. Jordan, and you, Mr. Raskin, are willing to join forces, I think we can probably uh, Make I'm them always see the light. willing to join forces with the gentleman from North Carolina. Well, I, I thank the gentleman, Ms. Uh, Ms. Atkinson. Let me let me come uh, come to you because I, I'm troubled. What you're saying is the FBI or DOJ or some entity actually um, surveilled your computer records and phone records, uh, but specifically your computer records, and you had that forensically looked into and they uh, with a high degree of confidence suggested that there, there had been intrusion is that correct yes sir there's no doubt about that from what the forensics people say who know a lot more about this than i do and have worked in the intelligence agencies in some cases there's an actual fingerprint on the software that is used for this that they recognize themselves or that can be recognized that's very unique it's a, a government proprietary software um, and not only that they didn't just look at my computer records. According to the forensics, they planted three classified documents in my computer. They had a keystroke monitoring program in there. They used Skype, which was on my computer, to secretly activate it to exfiltrate files and listen in on audio. People probably don't know that Skype, I certainly didn't know Skype could be used for that. So there are a lot of techniques they use and that they can use and access remotely to do this sort of thing. And I don't believe I was unique in terms of the only journalist this happened to. I was just one who found out about it because I had intel sources. So how has that affected your reporting um, since that time? Since you found that out, do you take different precautions? Do you not report on certain things? How, do, how has that affected you? It's definitely affected some of the stories I get. I can tell you I've had a, a senator who wouldn't answer a direct question to me on the phone after that, and I was asking him why, and he said, Cheryl, your phone is bugged. You know, people, once they've heard that, they're less likely to talk to me about sensitive topics, as well as sources inside government and corporations. A lot of people still will talk, surprisingly, because they assume that they're being monitored anyway, if they're sort of a government insider. But um, it has made a difference, and I do tell people, because they ask the question, can I protect their identity, or would it, would it ever be necessary to be revealed? And when I tell them I would protect it as best I could, but that I may have to if sued by an entity or... Uh, charged with something, and um, it has definitely chased away at least several stories and sources that I know of. Uh, for, for so, sure. so you mentioned a lawsuit earlier, and you said, I guess, with the unlimited budget of the federal government, uh, they continue to, I guess, uh, obstruct any settlement on this particular issue. Uh, can you can you share with this committee? Because here here's my concern. A free press that has been articulated by even uh, um, so eloquently by some on the minority side of this aisle uh, is shared by both the majority and the minority, and, and it should be. And yet, if you're trying to fight back and there is no accountability with regards to what was done to you, we've got, we've got an issue, and we should have an issue in a bipartisan way to say, uh, and, you know, at that particular point, you were working for CBS, so they're not normally associated with perhaps the, the, the broad brush that's painted for MSNBC or Fox or any, you know, they're, they're seen as a, a you know, down-the-road uh, mainstream media uh, network. So why, uh, tell, me, tell me about your lawsuit and where you are with that, if you can. The lawsuit's been going on over three years, and I have a... Um wonderful attorney who's been helping me tirelessly. If I were him, I would be tired by now because the Department of Justice under Trump has been no different than the Department of Justice under Obama for this purpose. And instead of trying to find out, after looking at our forensics, which are undeniable, who might have been responsible for this, uh, they simply litigate and try to get the case dismissed and, and protect, us, protect themselves from having discovery. And uh, suddenly, maybe Five, six weeks ago, after three years of us surviving things like sovereign immunity, uh, the judge dismissed the case, which we have now appealed to the Fourth Circuit, and my attorney hopes to take it to the Supreme Court. Um, not that we will necessarily win, because as he said, the facts are on our side, but the law is not. Government officials are well protected for duties that they commit 
as government workers, um, I would argue that when it comes to constitutional violations of the press and the public, that that falls outside of what should be protected, but it's up to the courts to decide. And I might mention uh, a case that was not, um, had anything to do with me in 2017, but impacted my case. Uh, the finding, as legal analysts examined it, said that Congress needed to pass a law to make government officials beholden or responsible for actions like what they did to me, that it was a law that was needed. I don't know how something like that becomes generated, and I'm doubtful you know, that that can get going um, just from knowing how things work. Uh, <laughs> I thank that. you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. And you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we can't hold a hearing about the importance of the freedom of the press without acknowledging mm -hmm. um, what the Trump administration is doing with regard to the fourth estate. Um, they have been highly critical of journalists. Uh, just as an example, uh, President Trump has singled out, mocked, and vilified reporters covering his campaign and his administration. He threatened to cancel the broadcast licenses of news organizations. He has labeled any unfavorable coverage of which there's no shortage fake news. He has called journalists, quote, and this is a direct quote, the enemy of the people. He even tweeted a video clip of himself tackling an individual with a superimposed label CNN onto the ground. Now, some people might dismiss these as jokes or empty gestures, but um, I, I want to hear your opinion on what this has done, if anything, to journalists and their ability to cover the news or to uh, report uh, from confidential sources and so forth. Mr. Bloom, your organization represents the legal interests of journalists. How has President Trump's attitude toward the press affected journalists' ability to cover his administration? You know, I, I would say, you know, journalists have thick skin. I don't know what they're doing in journalism schools, but journalists are ready to be criticized for their stories. And much of what this president does is no different from what other presidents have done in terms of wanting to shape a story, wanting to um, get better coverage in the future. But a lot of what this president does goes well beyond that. And it's a lot harder for a journalist in a local community to go write a story if, the, if their audience or if the people that they want to talk to about the story don't believe that they're going to get a fair shake in the story. And I think the biggest concern that we have is that the public is going to have a much harder time knowing what's accurate and what's not, and what's true and what's happening with current events in their communities and what's not. And I think that rises above, you know, partisanship, and I think that this, this bill is a way to strengthen the ability of journalists to tell important stories, and it's critical that we do more to protect journalists and protect the flow of information to the public. What do you mean when you say he's gone beyond what other presidents have done? Can you elaborate on that? Well, sure. I think it's a, it's a very strong contrast between presidents who will traditionally remind the public and remind ourselves about the vital role that a press plays, about the constitutional um, um, securities that, uh, that or the, the place that the Constitution uh, has for a free press. This president does not do that and tries at every turn to remind the public or to tell the public not to believe things like that. And I, I don't think that that's just a game, and I don't think it's just uh, has short-term benefits. I think it uh, it could be, you know, over the long term of, of of great concern. It's been reported to us that some some folks feel that uh, um, they have been physically assaulted, in part uh, because of a, a culture that's developed against the press. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Our organization works with a couple of other organizations, including the Committee to Protect Journalists um, and, and a few others, to track uh, press freedom. And one of the things they look at is, uh, is physical assaults. And the most dangerous place that they found uh, for a reporter is at a protest. That, that's the place where physical assaults happen. 
Um, and so obviously there's things that we advise our reporters do to take care, to work together, you know, to know where you are, uh, to protect oneself. Um, but but it's, it's a very big concern when journalists are out, are out there doing their jobs reporting in the field and they may be subject to some kind of physical attack. Um, I, I, you know, we don't know wh whether the re rhetoric, you know, has anything to do with any particular event, but it, it sure doesn't help. And how does this um, have an impact, if at all, on how uh, governments in other countries uh, treat journalists? I think it's very clear that um, uh, other countries <coughs> who are looking to the United States for uh, uh, leadership in our principles and our visions that we've traditionally espoused and that we hold dear, um, that other countries that may be uh, you know, dictators in other places um, uh, may be more emboldened to, to crack down on their own press um, and crack down on, on their own citizenry. And I think that that's a very real danger that we have. We hosted a number of journalists from throughout the Americas um, to come to the United States because they were concerned with press freedoms in the United States. It was the first time that the Amer Inter-American Press Association came to the United States. They visited other countries where press freedom uh, is endangered. Um, and, and, you know, I think in, in there, for them to witness uh, and talk with some of the uh, folks on Capitol Hill and elsewhere and journalists, um, they're concerned. They're concerned about the impact back home. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bloom, did journalists ever get it wrong? Sure. Do I mean, like to correct the record. Do journalists have a bias? Uh, if, uh, in a general sense, I would say the bias is for the truth. Well, that's, that's, that's accurate, too, but there's been all kinds of examinations, all kinds of studies, all kinds of surveys, all kinds of polling which indicate they have a, have a bias. And so what I'm asking is if journalists get it wrong and they have a bias, is it, um, is it a, should journalists be immune when they get it wrong from any type of criticism? Absolutely not, and they're okay. not. Just wanted to be clear, because this shield law is about protecting journalist sources. It's not about protecting journalists who get it wrong and maybe display a bias from criticism that may, in fact, be appropriate. Is that accurate? I, I would 100 percent agree that journalists are open to being criticized for getting things wrong or getting things wrong in stories. Uh, if it's inaccurate, they should correct it. And the industry is very committed to that kind of, you know, accountability. Okay. And this That's goes uh, beyond that. That's, that's important. All right, the gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Thank you. Uh, that wasn't exactly on point, but I'll, I'll just make a point for you. Um, I love journalists. I always felt like a good relationship with journalists in Wisconsin. I think I still do. Um, our country right now is, of course, divided, as it usually is. You know, about one half people voting for the Republican candidate, about one half the Democrat candidate every two years. Um, and one would think, given that, if you cover the average newsroom or the faculty of the average journalism school, you get about, say, in the last election, about one half voting for Donald Trump and one half voting for Hillary Clinton. Insofar as the total number of journalism, uh, journalism professors, say, wavered from that 50-50 rule, I think you're going to get distrust in, in the media. And that's unfortunate. I don't know why it shouldn't be 50-50. But, you know, it's something for you to think about. It's obviously not the purpose of the topic here today. but. Uh, I think there's a, a general public perception that something less than 50 percent of the journalism professors in our schools voted for Donald Trump last year. Now, I'll give you some questions. And if it is, you know, you can say that it's a problem or not, but I'd argue, you know, it, it shouldn't wander from that 50-50 divide that much. A um, couple questions for you. Uh, and I'm going to focus here a little bit about uh, um, university newspapers, because sometimes they break a surprising number of important stories. Do state shield laws afford student journalism, journalists the same protections as traditional journalists, for any one of the three of you? It varies depending on the state and the definition of who's covered under the particular statute. Um, some states define who a journalist is by reference to whether they get a paycheck and whether it's a full-time job or something like that, and others are more general. Uh, so it would vary from state to state. Do you think it should matter? My own view is that, um, especially college journalists, 
are entitled to the full protections of what I understand the First Amendment to mean, which includes a protection for confidential sources. Okay, next question. Um, well, let me give you three, three different students, and you can tell me whether they should be treated differently under the law. You have one student who is uh, writing for his local student newspaper. You have another student who is maybe interning or somehow uh, writing for a national news organization. And another student forms his own newspaper, kind of a, you know, opinion blog or, or a print page. Do you think those three students should be treated differently at all? I do not think they should be treated differently. Ms. Atkinson? I'm sorry, sir, I don't have an opinion. I haven't looked into that or I can't give a okay. thoughtful opinion about that. Mr. Blum? I agree with Mr. Levine. They should not be treated differently. Okay. Well, we'll give you a uh, following up on that. Let's say I'm writing for a student newspaper and I write a story on Greek life. And in that story, I talk, give an anonymous source saying that such and such incident of hazing happened or such and such drinking under age 21 happened and that I've been told this by members of a fraternity or sorority. Um, should that student be protected if he, they try to reveal his source for these things? I hate to ask you for more details, but, okay, I, um, <laughs> we, we, but we, what we, kind we, of we, lawsuit we, are they being subpoenaed? One, one, of the, one of the newspapers, say I went, I went to University of Wisconsin in Madison, the Badger Herald was a newspaper. If they write an article saying pro or con on Greek life and uh, say I was talking to uh, uh, a prominent member of the Greek community last weekend who told me about drinking at a football game or told me about hazing, both of which could be illegal, should that journalist be forced to reveal his sources for these stories? It's hard for me to envision a lawsuit in which a subpoena would be issued for that testimony. Um, but if there was, it's also hard for me to conceive of a situation in which oh. there wouldn't be ample alternative sources for the kind of information that the person Right. Well, let's say the, the, the university itself brings in the, the, the reporter and says, hey, we thought there was no hazing going on at these frats. You said there is. Tell us. What do you know? Do you, you think you should be able to compel them to uh, give that information or not? Under those circumstances, no, largely because there would be ample alternative sources for the university to go to and investigate on its own whether or not there's hazing at fraternities. And once we get done uh, making these journalism schools have, say, at least 30, 70 ratios for uh, people voted for Trump and Hillary, should the, uh, should the journalist, journalism students be educated on their protections under the SHIELD laws? Uh, absolutely. I think most journalism schools in this country do have media law courses where journalists uh, do learn about their legal rights and responsibilities. The gentleman, uh, Mr. Levine, uh, earlier you asked about the qualified privilege. Do you think we've got it right in this bill, hit, hit the right balance on protecting this fundamental liberty and yet have the exceptions that may be needed in case of national security or terrorist threat or that sort of thing? I do, yeah. uh, and I commend the committee. Uh, I mean, this obviously was the same bill that was introduced yep. back in 2007, but I thought it had it right then, and I think it has it right now. And, and would, would our other two witnesses, Ms. Atkins and Mr. Bloom, would you agree we've, we've, we've hit it pretty good? I would defer to the opinions of the experts who can read bills and make more legal sense of them and so You would on. agree, Mr. Bloom? I would. This is a very strong bill. All right. Let me ask you where, where, where the previous uh, gentleman was from Wisconsin talking about college campuses. We've had a hearing here on some of the, some of the shenanigans going on on college campuses. I just, and I pose a question to one of the professors there. This is more than a broader just First Amendment free speech rights. Um, I asked the question, can it, are you familiar with the safe spaces and free speech zones, some of these things going on on college campuses? Mr. Levine, you familiar with all this? Yeah. yeah. So I, I just asked the question, can a safe space and a free speech zone be in the same location? I think that's an enigma wrapped in a conundrum or something like that. But isn't that, isn't that sort of the point? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and you would, you, I think you would agree that, yes, they should be, could be, and are supposed to be under the First Amendment. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, and Ms. Atkinson, you would agree with that as well? Yes, sir. And Mr. Bloom? That's an easy one, yes. Yeah, because, I mean, I remember asking, uh, and, and should you be able to say things on, I asked, literally ask one professor this, Professor Raskin, I think you might remember this. Ask a professor, 
In a safe space on a college campus, could you make this statement, Donald Trump is president? And you know what the guy said? He started his answer by saying, it depends. Think about that. That is scary. So th this is why we are so focused on this First Amendment, not just to shield law for the press, but I mean, this is when the government comes after you, what, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Ms. Atkinson to tell more of the details of her story, because I want to know, frankly, how you found out what made you first suspect that the government was spying on you. I think that's a pretty important question as well. But we've got a host of things that I'm going to let Mr. Raskin kind of finish up here. But Ms. Atkinson, let's go to that question, because this, this scares me. Literally, this is why we've done so many hearings. When pastors in the pulpit are saying, you've got to be careful what you say, it'll jeopardize your tax exempt status. When students are saying on campus, you can't say certain things that are fact, like who the President of the United States is, you can't say that in certain safe spaces on campus. And now when we find out maybe, uh, or not maybe, but we find out a journalist was being spied on, this is scary stuff. So Ms. Atkinson, tell me how you first figured out the government was watching you. Well, sir, I never suspected that because it sounds so wildly crazy. No, it sounds crazy for me to even say it here. And this, <laughs> and this was before Edward Snowden and Associated Press and James Risen and Jim Rosen. So it sounded even stranger. But I was actually approached by two different people who I don't think know each other in the intelligence community who flagged me that they thought I might be surveilled because of practices that they saw or became aware of in the intelligence agency that used to be they said strictly forbidden or controlled that were now being done more liberally. So you had a confidential inside source come here yes, and say, sir. we think this is going on, and not just going on in general, but going on with you personally. Yes, sir. Okay. And then through, with help of another confidential source and a former FBI unit chief who helped connect me, we were able to get the first forensics exam. And they, they were literally blown away, according to them, when they saw this evidence. Um, that they were so shocked because there was a time when this would never have been done, they I said. I want to be clear. The people who did the forensic exam were people in background in government who know what they're looking for. Is that right? We've had many forensics exams, but that first one, I can't say who it is, and you can't make me. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't want to wait, make you. But um, it's, it's a government-connected person who knows exactly what government surveillance software does and looks like the proprietary software and flagged it and identified it with very quickly. So not to sound too, uh, too, too black helicopter here, but did, did, was this software installed on your computer remotely or do you think someone actually broke into your home or your office or both? This went on for a long time, um, but we were able to forensically look at instances of remote intrusions. We have dates, times, and seconds, and methods. For example, they used something called a BGAN satellite terminal one time at least. They also used a Hotmail email account, a friendly email, attached something to it that downloaded in the background when I clicked on something and that you, day. And you've, you've presented all this material to uh, a court and they've dismissed the case? We never got so far as to present all of it. We presented some overviews and right. it was considered at the time plausible and we survived many motions to dismiss along the way. Um, but after we added a telephone company to the lawsuit, a few couple months back, there was new considerations and the case was dismissed. Okay. Yes, sir. Got a few other things. But I, I would say anybody who wants to look at some of these forensics, especially at the Department of Justice, for the sake of trying to find who did it or identify for their own purposes, because I think they should be concerned and I don't think I was the only one, mm -hmm. I, I think they really ought to be on that personally. Yeah. Well, we're trying to get all kinds of information from the Department of Justice and we find it extremely difficult. Let me ask you about the, uh, one of the catalysts for this hearing and I think for Mr. Raskin and I um, teaming up and working on this legislation. This is Allie Watkins, the, the reporter for the New York Times and what happened to her. So Mr. Levine, can you tell me, give me your thoughts on that situation, um, just in a general sense? Well, as I said in my testimony, Mr. Chairman, I, I do not know whether the Justice Department followed its own guidelines when it um, uh, procured her records. Um, it doesn't seem to me from what I've read in the press that it's likely that they did. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but if they didn't, that's a serious concern because mm -hmm. they have guidelines that they're supposed to be following. Um, if, if they did fi follow them, I have a hard time understanding given what I know has been reported in the popular press about the nature of the investigation that led to the indictment that is uh, now a criminal prosecution, uh, that uh, 
the guidelines were complied with substantively. That is, that there was enough of a substantive case that could have been made to authorize the, the seizure of her records. But I'm hesitant to, no, to really opine upon that because I don't know the facts. No, I understand. Mr. Bloom. I, I think for, for, for us, the reporters committee is also, um, you know, looking at what they did. Uh, we are concerned, you know, the media organizations were concerned about the breadth of information that was taken, um, the delayed notice to her, um, and those are the kinds of things that over time we're going to want to understand um, it, it, how did the guidelines apply and, 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 and were they applied fairly. And um, we, we have worked um, on other cases, on other issues to unseal court records of how leak investigations work. Um, so that we have a better public record, the public has a better understanding of how this works. And that's what we'll be doing in this case as well. And that's what we're, we're involved in the news media uh, dialogue, um, working with the Justice Department on that. And, and through that, we're hoping that over time we'll have a better understanding of whether the guidelines were really followed or not. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just finish with one last question. In, in her opening statement, Ms. Atkinson used the word chilling, uh, the chilling impact that, that not having a shield law and some of the other things that we have witnessed in the last few years in this country relative to the First Amendment, what that has for a free society for our, I would argue, for our country. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing in the broader context, because I, I think the term Ms. Atkinson used is, is right on target. I, I do feel that there's a chilling impact. Um, I, think, I think Ms. Atkinson even referenced in one of her answers she was talking to, I believe that you said a member of Congress who said, I don't want to answer that question, Cheryl, because your phone's bugged. If that's actually going on, that is as chilling as it gets. So um, fill me in on that, and then I'll, I'll yield the balance of the committee's time to the, to the gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Levine, let's just go down the line. There are, a lot of it is documented in my written testimony, but there have been multiple examples of journalists who have gone on the record and said not only that I couldn't have reported on this story if I couldn't rely on confidential sources, but also that I didn't report on this story because people were afraid to come forward. Yep. Uh, there's a particular example that I cite in my written testimony about a story in the Cleveland Plain Dealer or that would have been in the Cle Cleveland Plain Dealer, but the editor spiked the story because he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to protect the identities of the confidential sources. Yeah. Ms. Atkinson. I would say that I find myself more concerned not about whether the Justice Department followed the letter of its own guidelines, but the stuff that they're doing, to say cynically, that fall outside all guidelines and scrutiny at all, the secret stuff uh, that they may be doing or politicizing intel tools. And I don't blame an administration for this. I blame what I've come to call myself the persistent bureaucracy, because I think this, is, this happens under the administrations that I have covered in 24 years, and it seems to tighten up a little more with each one. I also would put part of the blame in the lap of the media. We haven't done a good job at making, clawing back our own rights when they are taken from us, and I have some experience with that. I don't need to go into detail in my job where we have been challenged but maybe not been as aggressive as we could have or should have at fighting that partly because we're just too busy covering the news to devote a lot of bandwidth and resources to making sure we retain our rights. Well said. I mean, it, what, Lois Lerner wasn't the person running the IRS. She wasn't confirmed by the Senate. Doug Schulman was the guy running. He, what, he, he's not the one who orchestrated the targeting that took place of innocent conservative groups across this country. So you're exactly right. Persistent bureaucracy, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a good way to phrase it. She was at that near a high level, but she was in the bureaucracy, not the one who faces, not the one who comes in front of the committee until we found out what, what she was doing. So I am very concerned about that. And as, and as you well say, the things that have happened that we're in the midst of, and I know Mr. Raskin and I would have some disagreement on, but things that happen at the FISA court, um, this is the scary stuff. And, and we, we got to get to the bottom of all this as we're looking at First Amendment liberties. Mr. Bloom, you get the last word. Well, then, say, Mr. Raskin. say briefly. You know, journalists and, and media outlets around the country are facing enormous economic pressures. And so if you um, can challenge and try to threaten and undermine that economic stability of a local news outlet with just by dragging someone in a court trying to get a, you know, get a subpoena for their information or suing them for libel when you know you don't have a case, uh, 
Um, that's troubling and that, that provides it. So the lack of those kind of legal protections like we're talking about today, really undermining the ability of the press to report freely and without concern. I've taken a lot of time here, so I'll let Mr. Raskin ask a few more questions thank if you. the gentleman has some. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, you, you posed an interesting question of whether or not uh, a free speech zone can be a safe space at the same time. Um, and uh, I got to thinking about it, and I suppose my answer is yes, because under the First Amendment, the whole country is a free speech exactly. zone. Exactly. And uh, it is a safe space in the sense that it's safe for democratic discussion and dialogue. Um, you know, the, uh, the First Amendment doesn't guarantee that nobody's feelings are ever going to be hurt or that people aren't going to be offended or disagree by other people's thoughts. Uh, I remember reading about the great comedian Lenny Bruce, who kept getting arrested for his comedy, which was very risque at the time, and he used words some people didn't like and so on. But um, somebody said to him, um, he said he had a, a right of free speech. And someone said, well, not if your speech is offensive. And he said, my parents came to America in order to be offensive and not get thrown into jail for it. Um, and of course, everybody gets offended by something different. I tell my students that free speech is like an apple, and uh, everybody wants to take just one bite out of it. You know, somebody doesn't like left-wing speech, and somebody doesn't like right-wing speech, and um, somebody doesn't like pro-monarchical speech, and somebody doesn't like anti-monarchical speech, and racist speech, and sexist speech, and obscene speech, and pornographic speech, and so on. And you take all these bites, and pretty soon there's nothing left of it, because everybody's been able to get rid of the thing that they like the least. And so the true test of the First Amendment, of course, is if we're willing to stand up for even the speech that we abhor, even the speech that, that we hate. Well, um, 49 states, all the states except for Wyoming, and I don't know that uh, the issues come up in Wyoming, but 49 states have passed um, press shield laws, exactly the kind that Chairman Jordan and I are introducing now, um, or they've simply adopted the privilege as a, a matter of um, judicial interpretation. Um, would you guys agree that that's a pretty fair statement of the sentiments of the American people about this? Would you agree that the people recognize the critical role that the press plays, not for the press themselves, people might love or hate particular media outlets, but the critical role that the press plays for democracy. Would you agree that that is a pretty fair statement of where the public would be on our legislation? Mr. Yes. Yeah. It would seem so, sir. Yeah. Mr. Levine. I, absolutely. I think that um, when I was back here in 2007, the Vice President said that um, this isn't a pro-press bill, it's a good government bill. And that's really what we're talking about. Yeah. I, I want to close just by um, invoking the terrible incident that just took place in Annapolis, Maryland, where um, five uh, staffers um, of, a, of a famed local newspaper uh, were killed by an assailant. And um, the community rallied passionately to the support of the newspaper and the families of the slain. Um, and I think that the whole state uh, has stood up very strongly um, for the rights of journalists and for people who do the often unsung work that local journalists do, but they really um, create and then continue a sense of community in so many of our small towns and small cities um, across the country. They don't make a lot of money. Uh, people get mad at them. People send them hate mail and so on. But really, they are the lifeblood of uh, American political culture. Um, and so I, I hope that, um, that the three of you speak for uh, journalists and media um, employees across the country in being very vigorous in standing up for your rights. Um, you know, people love to kick around the press at different points, but when you really stand back and think about it, um, we would not have much of a democracy without the work that you reporters do. So I want to thank all of you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're set to close, but I'll be happy to give a minute or two to the gentleman from Alabama if he has some closing thoughts or a question. Mr. Chairman, I've never gotten a complaint about a short hearing, so I yield back. <laughs> <laughs>
We want to again thank, thank you all very, very, uh, very much. You, you were all tremendous and great opening testimony and, and good responses to the, to the questions from the members. And we are going to keep working and see if we can actually get this, uh, get this passed. Thank you all. Thank you. We are adjourned.